Good morning. My name is Benton Craig. Welcome to Huntsville First United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here with us today, whether it's in person or via live stream. Please stand for, with us for our responsive call to worship in your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make his deeds known to all people. For he is the Lord our God, faithful to a thousand generations. Sing his praises. Tell of his wonderful works and glory in his holy name. Let those who seek the Lord rejoice. For he is the Lord our God, faithful to a thousand generations. Search for God and for his strength. Never stop looking for him. For he is the Lord our God, faithful to a thousand generations. Please stand with us while we do our processional hymn, Come Ye Faithful People, in page 694 in the hymnal. It is good to be gathered together in the house of the Lord this morning. I invite you to remain standing as we join our voices together in affirming our faith. The affirmation is found in your worship programs. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. continue to worship this morning. Before you're seated, I want to encourage you to look around you and, uh, and look in the 
10 feet around you in your center of care and, uh, and welcome those who are around you, especially if there's somebody that you don't know. Greet them with, my name is Byron. Um, not your, my name, but your name. <laughs> Y'all know what you do. Y'all know what you I don't have, oh, am I live? Huh? Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Vonderheide. I'm one of our associate pastors here, and it is good to be with you all this morning. Uh, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is, as you came in, you probably saw the blood mobile. It feels really weird to call it that, but that's what it is. Uh, the blood mobile is out there, and if you want to donate, I know that they need a supply of blood. Uh, so if you have time right after church, go donate, um, which would be really good. Um, I'm also very excited about next Sunday. Next Sunday, August the 6th, is going to be Upgrade Sunday. Upgrade Sunday is when we, our students and children, they move up to a new Sunday school class. Uh, and it's important for us to kind of start the year out right and to get our students connected to their teachers. So that'll be August 6th. Also that Sunday, we call it the blessing of the backpack. Now we're not really blessing the backpack, but since they go to school and we'll be taking a backpack, we bless the students that will be taking the backpacks and our teachers and the people that work in our schools. And so next Sunday is an exciting Sunday for us to come together as a church and to pray for our community and our schools. Also in the pews, there is an attendance pew book. Uh, please fill that out so that we know that you are here this morning. And so the Lord be with you. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for each person that is here worshiping and celebrating your name. Lord, I pray that you would be present, that you would be with us, that you would be here in this room, and that we would sense and know your spirit is here. God, I lift up our community to you of believers. Lord, I pray for the people who are broken and hurting and they need your love and your comfort. Lord, I pray that you would give it freely. Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to, to love the people around us, how to walk in your faith and in your love. Lord, you are so good to each one of us, and I thank you. And now would you join me in saying the, the prayer that the Father has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I want to invite our ushers forward.
I want to invite our children to go to head to the back. There's a shepherd back there for Children's Church. And as they're going back, let's pray for them in our offering. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our children, for the little ones among us. Lord, I pray that you would grow them to be like you, that they would understand your love, that they would love one another around them, and they would grow to be like you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the adults who will be taking care of them. I pray that you would give them wisdom on how to, uh, to teach them and to grow with them. Lord, I pray that you'd be present with them. Lord, I thank you so much for the, the offering, the, the blessings that you have given each one of us and, and how you bless this church. Lord, I pray that we would bring you honor and glory as we use it in your will. Amen. Would you join us in continuing singing, Seek Ye First, hymn number, number 405. Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, starting at verse 31. You can follow along in your pew Bibles. He told them another parable. This kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perk in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he did it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, when he found one of the great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the basket, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you. <clears throat> this is, uh, next, next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday, I think, um, because uh, it is the beginning of uh, school actually starts this week for y'all. Is that right? Good grief. Um, yeah, school starts this week for many of our students. Uh, and then next week we'll be praying for them uh, as they bring their backpacks forward. And so we encourage all of our students to bring your backpacks ne with you next week. And, uh, and as we lay them on the altar, we'll, we'll be praying for you during our morning prayer time in all of our morning worship services. Um, uh, and, and we'll also begin confirmation classes next, uh, next Sunday night, which is, a, which is a treat for me to get to be a part of those confirmation groups uh, as well. Um, but to, but I say all that because today is actually a big treat too. And so it's not just next Sunday, but this Sunday is a big treat because I don't know if y'all noticed, but um, we've got some of our students who are leading us in worship today. Now we're used to Walker and Benton uh, being acolytes and, uh, and leading us in worship in that way. But this morning, Benton was also our lay liturgist and she did an excellent job in leading us this morning. And so we want to uh, we want to thank her. But then we also had Hartwell and Channing, who were our ushers this morning. And uh, and, and it's great to see on the fifth Sundays. And it just kind of works out to be uh, well this year uh, that we've got uh, next Sunday is the beginning of school and our up, upgrade um, Sunday. Is that right? Did I say that right? Okay. Um, I always wanted to call it upcharge uh, Sunday, and that's not the right thing to call it. It's, it's me. It's not it. It's not it. Um, and, uh, and so it just happens that the Sunday before upgrade is, uh, is a fifth Sunday where we get to have, where we invite students to lead up our worship services. And so it's just really been a treat to get to see y'all up here and to lead in different ways. So Benton, come back when it's not a fifth Sunday, and, we'll, and you can read scripture again. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's really is a treat uh, for us. Uh, we've been spending time in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. And specifically, we've been spending some time in, uh, in Jesus' sending stories. Remember the first, uh, first uh, bit in July, we were, we were, uh, Jesus was sending his disciples with some instructions about, um, about what was going to happen, how they would be received as well. And then for the last three weeks, we've been focusing in on parables. And these are parables from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and they've all been from, the, from chapter 13 as well. And, uh, and the first couple of weeks, we had, uh, we skipped. Uh, we had a passage, and then we'd skip over, and we have another, another passage, and a passage, and we skip over and do another passage, and today is no different. We've got a passage, and we skip over and do another passage. The thing that's different about this week versus the last couple of weeks is that in the previous weeks, what we've had is we've had a parable, so Jesus would tell a parable, and then later he would explain it to his disciples. Because at the very end of this passage, in verse 51, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Do you understand this? And his disciples, did you see what their answer was? They answered, Yes. But you know what? I think that their answer of yes was kind of like one of these, Yes. No idea what he's talking about. <laughs> because that's kind of the way parables work. Parables are these stories that have real life implications that are speaking about God's kingdom or God's nature or God's character. And so in all of these parables, it's helpful to have these explanations from Jesus because sometimes we're not quite sure exactly. We could take it in many different ways. The first parable of the sower, uh, we, uh, we heard and we thought we could be the seed, we could be the sower itself, we could be the soil. And it's, there's many ways that we can hear that. Last week with the wheat and the weeds, we can think to ourselves, um, was he talking about me when he was talking about the weeds? Or was he talking about someone else? And if he was talking about someone else, I have to be careful about judging whether or not that was someone else he was talking about. Because he also said, wait for the end. And then the angel will come and, they'll, and do the harvesting. And then you'll have the separation between wheat and weeds when you can tell the difference. When fruit is born, that's when you can tell the difference between the children of God and the children of the enemy. That's helpful for us to remember. This, this week's parables, we've really just got a flurry of parables, and it would really be a fool's errand to try to hit on all these different parables in one Sunday. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to hit on all these different parables in one Sunday. Um, because I think there is a thread that goes together that connects all of them, uh, all of them together, 
Um, and I'm going to try to see if I can, if I can hit on that uh, thread just a little bit. And so, and so before we begin, uh, would you pray with me? And so, gracious God, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross so that we can focus only on you. And Lord, I pray that you would write your name on all of our hearts so that we will proclaim your name as Savior and Lord when we leave this space uh, today. Amen. So the parables are these uh, kind of earthy stories. Remember, we had these, uh, these uh, farming or agricultural kind of uh, stories that, that Jesus has told before. He's going to tell a couple more of these as well. Um, but these are uh, things that we can wrap our brains around as far as visualizing and seeing these, these stories. But then they have kingdom meanings. Remember, I might have said this two weeks ago when I was in here, that, that these parables are told in such a way that you could actually see them. And if you, look, if you hold it a different way, you know, like a prism, you hold it in one way and it looks like the light's coming through one way and it looks this way. And then if you, and if you turn it just a little bit, you can see the light coming through in a different way. Parables are like that as well. Because you can see it, and it looks like, and it's like, oh, this is clearly what it means. But then a different circumstance or a different hearing or a different hearer, and you might experience the parable in a different way. Today you might be the soil, and tomorrow you might be the sower, and the next day you might be the seed. And this is kind of the way that these parables work. Um, and so today I really want you to kind of just be open as we hear these parables um, to what this might mean for you. And so I might, I'm going to end each of these little sections with this phrase, could the kingdom of God be like that? And so the first parable is, the, is this parable that we call the parable of the mustard seed, where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it grows to be the greatest um, what, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what the translation from the RSV Benton that you read, but it said it's basically like the, the, the biggest garden bush or something, the, the, the biggest uh, piece of the garden. Um, but my translation says the greatest of shrubs, which is not a great compliment, um, and becomes like a tree so that birds of the air can come and make nests in its branches. And so here we, we think about this parable of the mustard seed. In fact, we think of, when we think of the mustard seed, we tend to think about uh, uh, this other thing that, that Jesus has said, that, that if you have faith as small as the mustard seed, then you can say to this mountain, get up from here and go into the sea and it will. Isn't that what Jesus said one time? Well, that's not what he's saying right here. But he's still using the reference of this mustard seed, which is a very tiny seed. And y'all have seen mustard seeds before, probably. Mustard seed, I wouldn't say that it's the smallest seed of all seeds, probably. I'm sure that there's a smaller seed. But it's a small seed. And it produces something that becomes a big bush. Um, which is still not a great compliment, I don't think. Now, when you think about it like this, here's what the kingdom of God is like. He's saying... The kingdom of God is like something that's very small, that can be unnoticed, imperceptible, that's planted in the ground. When it's planted in the ground, it becomes something big enough so that the birds could come and perch on its, on its branches. It didn't necessarily say that the birds could come and make nests in it because it wasn't that big, but, it could come, but they could come and rest on it. They could light on it. They could sit on it. They could stay on it. They could be there for a little while. I think Mark's version of this parable says, that uh, it puts it in within a garden and says that this mustard seed was grown up into a garden so that the birds could come and, bur and, and perch on its branches, which any gardener would say, the last thing you want to do is to invite more birds in, right? And yet that's what, the, that's what this parable is doing. It's inviting more birds in. It's, it's this mustard seed that grows up to become a bush, a great bush, and so that these birds could come and perch on it. And birds... Um, in some of our imagery were, uh, was compared to those, those ones who were outsiders, the dirty ones that would be trying to get into and not the ones that are insiders. And so he's saying that the kingdom of God could be like this mustard seed that starts off very small, imperceptible, you would overlook it, and yet it grows up to be something that's great. Now, he could have said something different because he could have said um, the kingdom of God is like is like the uh, is like the seed of a cedar tree, which I've never seen the seed of a cedar tree. Herb, you can probably tell me about that later. But I'm sure it's not huge, right? I mean, it's a seed. It's still a seed. It's still small. And so, it's, and so he could have said, this, uh, the kingdom of God is like the seed of an acorn of a cedar tree or of an oak. 
that when planted in the ground, it becomes these great oaks like the oaks of Mamre. Or it could become like these great cedars, like the cedars of Lebanon. But instead, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like the smallest of all seeds that you would overlook in a minute. And then when it's grown up, it grows up not to be some great towering sequoia, but it grows up to be the greatest of all bushes. That's kind of what the kingdom of God is like. It starts small, and then it becomes something that birds can perch in. It's productive, it's fruitful, you can see that it's obviously taken root, but it starts off as something that you can't see. Or yeast, the next parable is of yeast. He says, he says the kingdom of God is like yeast, which some translations say that, this, that, the, that, that a woman takes and hides the yeast in the flour as if, it was, as if it was a deceptive act. Like this was not an intentional thing, like, like the flour wasn't intended to be leavened, but instead she had hidden the yeast within the flour. But we know that when we're baking, we do hide the yeast within the flour because that's what we do. You take the yeast, you put it on one side. I don't know if, how much baking I'll do, but you put the yeast on one side, you put the salt on the other side. You make sure that the two don't mix because the salt will, will nullify the yeast. And, and then you mix them up. You start to kind of mix up the, the, uh, the flour just a little bit. And then you add in the wet ingredients and you start to mix it up so that it gets all a little bit doughy. And then you kind of add more water as you go and it gets to this good consistency. And then you roll it out and you knead it. Y'all know this, right? So you knead it, and then you press it out, and then you let it sit for an hour, for two hours, for three hours. You find a good window. You put it into the, into the windowsill that gets all the sun coming in so that it's a little hotter. You put it in the oven with just a little bit of heat so that it's enclosed. You put a little saran wrap over it or a little tea towel over it so that it co it's covered up and it can't, all the air can't escape. It puts a little bit of pressure in there. And then under the pressure, this little bit of yeast, and it doesn't take very much yeast at all, this little bit of yeast, like 10 grams of yeast to make a, a loaf of bread, this little bit of yeast, 10 grams within four cups of, of flour, um, produces a great loaf of, of bread. In this parable, it's actually the measure that he's, that he's using here is, is enough to make 40 loaves of bread. And so he's saying that this woman had, had mended in and the yeast to make into this flour that's the, enough flour to make 40 loaves of bread. And then you mix it up so that you don't see it. Again, the kingdom of God, is the kingdom, could the kingdom of God be like something that is imperceptible when it's mixed in? You can't even see it. Once you've mixed in the yeast, you can't see it. You can, I mean, you can't see it amongst the flour. Once you've, once you've fooled with it just a little bit, even in the dry state, you can't tell that there's yeast in there. And especially once you put, start putting the wet ingredients in, you can't tell anything's in there. So the kingdom of God, could the kingdom of God be like this thing that is imperceptible to our eye that we can't see and except we can only see it once it's taken activity within the within the ones that are around it could the kingdom of god be so pervasious pervasive infectious or contagious i guess so that it would get into the soil get into the flower get into the people and it's only then that you would start to see it grow. And here's the problem with this, is that yeast sometimes is being used as a negative image in the Old Testament. It's been used as a negative image as those who are corrupt or corruption itself. And so in a way, I mean, could you look at it and say that Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God is like kneading in just a little bit of corruption <laughs> into the flour. It's mixed in. Or it's, it's, it's the way that that corruption goes. And the kingdom of God is like this. In a bad way, the corruption comes. But in a good way, the kingdom of God is like this yeast that gets worked into the dough. And after you've worked it and kneaded it and proved it, then you bake it and you realize that it's this beautiful loaf for these beautiful loaves of bread. The kingdom of God is like, could the kingdom of God be like something that's small? But when mixed in, well treated to the right conditions, can grow to become something that's nourishing to all. The third parable is the parable of the treasure. And he says that the kingdom of God is like someone who finds a treasure that was already hidden in a field. 
he finds a treasure that was hidden in a field and he takes that treasure and he realizes this treasure and then he rehides it. So you find this treasure that's something that's valuable that's out in the field and you find the treasure instead of, now I don't know, some of y'all would have taken that treasure and you would have brought, just brought it home with you. And said, well, now the treasure's mine, guess what? But instead, this is more, I guess this is more of an ethical approach that you've got the treasure, the treasure is there and then you say, the treasure is in this field and you bury the treasure and then you go and sell everything that you've got so that you can buy the field that contains the treasure. Now, I don't know that any of us would do that. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe it depends on what the treasure is. If it was sitting on oil, then we might say, ah, hey, we discovered oil. This is great. I'm going to sell everything that I've got so to buy that patch of land, and that land is going to produce uh, enough riches and enough fortune that I can live off of it for the rest of my days. My grandchildren can live off of it for the rest of my days. But I'm not sure that that's exactly what this is intended to say. Saying, the king, could the kingdom of God be like something that is so valuable, so precious, that when you find it, that you realize that you would sell everything that you've got in order to pursue it? Could the kingdom of God be like something that is so rich, so valuable, such a treasure, that you would take it and hide it again so that you could go and sell everything that you've got just so that you could have the ability to be near it? Could the kingdom of God be so valuable that we give up everything in order to pursue it? This is where it gets a little hard because I think some, uh, sometimes the, our answer might be, I don't know. Maybe not. But Jesus is really saying the kingdom of God is like this. That is this precious. Maybe it would make more sense to us if we were talking about the pearl. Because the pearl we can actually see and we can put some value to it. We can see, uh, we can see it and we can imagine how, what the worth is of this, of this pearl. And we can think about what we, would, what we would sell it for on eBay or how we would monetize that when we put it in a museum or something like that. And so we think about the, this next parable where the merchant goes out and he's searching for pearls. And when he finds this pearl of great price that he, that he sells everything that he's got and then, so that he can go and buy that pearl. Now, it doesn't say that he goes to buy that pearl so that he can then buy that pearl and then sell it on eBay. It doesn't say he's going to buy that pearl and then, um, and then put, it on a, put it on a chain and, and uh, sell it as a necklace. He doesn't say anything like that. He just says that this pearl in, it, in and of itself is so valuable that this person would be willing to sell everything that they've got. They would leave everything that they have. The reality is already squelched, and then they would sell it, and they take the proceeds so that they could buy this pearl because it is so valuable. And even to use my hands like this, to imagine that a pearl would be that big is a little silly, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know that it would ever be that big. I'm imagining that it's that big because it would have to be that big to be that valuable, to be worth that much for me to be able to sell any, everything that I had so that I would go and buy it. And yet he says, the kingdom of God is like that. Like a merchant who would sell everything that these got, they've got so that they could buy this pearl of great price. And so the only comparisons that I can have with this is in our, in our everyday life. If like uh, uh, Fred Webster is a huge Chicago Cubs fan. Y'all, I mean, pray for him and it's okay. But um, he... Um, but it, it, would, it would be as if, uh, as if Fred said, found, the, uh, found the, the hat that was, or the glove that was worn by, the gloves that were worn by Tinkers ever in chance, the great uh, double play combo uh, in the 1920s or something like that from the code, 1908s or uh, the aughts from the Cubs. And, he's, and he goes to Dorothy Ann one day and he says, Dorothy Ann, good news. I've sold everything that we've got so that I could have the mitts that were used by Tinker, Evers, and Chance. And Dorothy Ann, I, I mean, you can imagine, we'll, we'll imagine what that conversation would have sounded like later. But I don't think it would have gone well, would it? But it's, that's the only thing that I can put in my own imagination is to think about something, what would be so valuable you know, Michael Jordan's uh, jersey from when he was in North Carolina and he, when he won the national championship. I don't know. But something that's so valuable that I would place such value on it that I would sell everything that I've got and then go and purchase that. And then once I've got it, I'd be saying, I'm not sure what I do now. 
And yet the kingdom of God is just like that. In a, in a sense, it's like the thing that, the thing that threads all these, par- these uh, parables together so far is that all these parables are speaking about almost like l- ludicrous, ridiculous behavior. The, parable, uh, the, the kingdom of God is like something that's so small, imperceptible, and yet it grows up to be not a great tree, not a great uh, cedar, not a sequoia, but a great bush. Or the, the kingdom of God is like a, a yeast that gets kneaded into dough and it becomes bread. Or the kingdom of God is, so, is like something that's so valuable that you would sell everything that you've got just so that you can own the land. Or the kingdom of God is something that's so valuable that you would sell everything that you have just so that you can possess it. And we would think, I, I think we might think to ourselves, I'm not sure that the kingdom of God is that valuable. And I think that's kind of what Jesus is getting at. The kingdom of God is that valuable. And it really is. Because some of y'all have experienced that. Because when Jesus gets a hold of your life and he's, he turns you away from your own ways and you turn toward God's ways, then you have recognized that there are changes that happen in your life. Sometimes they're imperceptible. Sometimes they're not immediate. But there are changes that happen in your life that that over the course of time start to change your own priorities, what is important to you, what is not important to you, and they change, and then they start to change some of, the, some of the conversations that you make, some of the decisions that you make, and some of the relationships that you have. You know that. The deeper you get in with, with Jesus and the deeper you get in love with God, the more that you realize that it is pervasive, like yeast. It soaks into every pore of you. And it starts to change you. Not in a corrupting way, unless corruption is in a good way. That it changes you from the inside out. And then you find yourself making decisions that are not just based based on how much money can I acquire, or what position can I get next, or how can I pursue the best and the biggest and the brightest. But they start to become more about what is it that God is leading me to do? What is the right thing to do? And what are the right decisions to make in this moment? And sometimes, honestly, when Jesus gets into our life, we have already made those decisions and we have decided we have sold ourselves for allegiance with Jesus. But we want to go back and make a return sometimes. It doesn't feel worth it. But it is. Jesus is saying, The kingdom of God is like this, something that's so valuable that you change everything in order to acquire it. And the crowds listening to the parables, they might have heard this and they might have just kind of dismissed it. And his disciples, when he had asked them, do you understand, have you understood all of this? His disciples nodded. Yeah. But understanding something and taking it in and really owning it and living into it might be two different things. Because we might understand the realities and the implications and and the changes that might need to make in our lives if we were to make this real. But we might not be able to come to grips with what it's going to take for me to do it. To allow that little piece, that little yeast or that little seed to take hold. Or to allow ourselves to give over our own importance, our own priorities for the priorities of God. Which leads us to the last parable. And this is the parable of the net. And I'm not really sure if this is a drag net or a cast net, but I'm assuming it's one of the two. It sounds like a kind of a combination of both. The drag net might have been this net was, that was placed across uh, this expanse of of the sea and it was held on one end by somebody and another end by somebody else maybe they had their boats and they'd go toward one another and they was it was just kind of spread across it weighted on the bottom and so then when you drug it in you'd pull in all the fish that you could get but a cast net was one that you would sit in the boat and you'd cast the net off the boat and you had these these weights on it um, that you can still find these 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 uh Archaeologists are still finding some of these weights in the Sea of Galilee. And they throw this net off of the side of the boat into the water. 
And it was just this big, huge net that they'd throw. Sometimes they'd take two boats and throw it. And he'd go down into the, into the water and you'd pull it, start to pull it back up. And when you pull it back up, you'd pull up everything that was in there. And this is a different kind of fishing, right? So they weren't using uh, the little bobbers and corks and they weren't using uh, flies. They weren't tying their own. They, wasn't, they weren't using any of the kind of stuff that we would use in modern fishing. This is an old school commercial fishing. And we might say it's not quite as romantic as standing in the, standing in the river with the, with the water running and doing the fly fishing and catching the trout or something like that. It's not. But you can catch a lot of fish quick. Remember there's this miracle where Jesus was, uh, where Jesus was telling somebody to cast the net on the other side of the boat. Y'all remember that? They cast the net on the other side of the boat and they started to pull it in. What, y'all, anybody remember what happened? They couldn't pull it in. It was full of fish. And if I remember correctly, it was 153 fish, which sounds odd to be so specific, but it was true. And they started to pull in the nets, and they couldn't pull them in. They pulled in their friends. They called in their friends, and they said, y'all need to help us pull in this net. There's too many fish in here. So they started to pull in the net, and there were so many fish that the boat was about to tip over. And so they had to pull in others to help to pull up the fish. This is the kind of net that we're talking about, this net that you would just kind of cast off the side, and then you'd wait And then you'd pull it back up, and then whatever fish were in there, that was your catch. And then, of course, you'd go through and you'd kind of cull them here and there, and you'd take this and that and all that stuff. But he says the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like somebody who throws a net up into the sea to fish and then pulls up all kinds of fish. It doesn't just say bottom feeders and top feeders. It doesn't just say the ones that will get the spinner bait and the worms. It doesn't just say the ones that that you want to eat and the ones you don't want to eat. It doesn't just say it it catches the pretty spotted ones and and it catches the ugly, like the gar or the jack salmon or something like that. It catches the predator fish. It catches the prey fish. It catches the ones that are just timid. It catches the ones that are aggressive. It catches the ones that are parasites and the ones that, that, ones that help out one another. It catches little dory, you know, that little fish. And it catches, and it catches the meat. I mean, it catches all the fish. So you throw the net out there and you pull up all the fish and you catch all the fish and then God can do the sorting. It says the kingdom of God is like this. It's like, finally, it's like this net that you throw out into the sea and you pull it in and you might pull in all kinds of fish. Sometimes we forget that. That in God's type of fishing, that God's not just valuing the red fish or the blue fish or the white fish or the yellow fish, but all those fish that are brought in are part of God's catch. They're all valuable to God. Now, God can be the one, and God is actually the only one that we can trust to sort them out. And God can do the sorting, the ones to keep and the ones to not keep. But God's net is big, vast, and thrown out into the sea, and it pulls back in. Y'all, it pulls in so many that we need help pulling it up. And it pulls in fish of all types. That's what the kingdom of God's like. Revelation kind of gives us this image of this as well, where it's, where it's kind of speaking about what uh, the kingdom of heaven, when it's, when it's all kind of coming together in this, in this last, in this great city, that it kind of speaks about like where, where all the different nations are gathered together and everybody is just all together in, in the presence of God. We have these images and these visions of what this looks like. And Joe and I were talking about this in between services and, and, and that there's this tension between an already and a not yet that we have with the kingdom of God. And it's true that there is this already and not yet. But y'all, we are not waiting for Jesus to return for the kingdom of God to be consummated. The kingdom of God began when he came. And he left us to tend it for good or ill, mostly ill, for good or ill. He left us to tend the kingdom, to care for those that are his. 
And so sometimes it's confounding and frustrating. And sometimes it's like that mustard seed. You know, you plant that mustard seed and you're like, when will it ever take? And it might take forever to start to come forth and, uh, and bloom with fruit. And sometimes it is like this just a little bit like the yeast that is kneaded into the dough and you're not even sure that it's going to take. So you give it the right conditions and time and you allow God to work. The kingdom of God is frustrating because God doesn't just flip a switch and make everything perfect. He doesn't just flip a switch and make us perfect. But instead, God calls us into a relationship that is dynamic and changing. And it has the ability to change the world and honestly has the ability to change us as well. And that's kind of, in essence, what these parables eventually come down to. Um, Shakespeare said it. I think it was Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And in that sonnet, he continued to kind of compare his love to the summer's day. And some of y'all have written some romantic poetry to the one you love, I'm sure. And in that romantic poetry, you have compared, you've made some similes and metaphors and some comparisons between the one that you love and, and many different earthly things. And you meant it. And it was full, coming fulsome from, from your heart. But you know, the reality is, as much as he meant it, Shakespeare meant it, shall I compare thee to the summer's day? We know at the end of the day, any of those comparisons still fall short of our love, don't they? They still don't quite measure up to the person that we're imagining, the one that we're honoring, the one that we want to lift up. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And we do. But at the end of it, we would end by saying, and yet all of these things pale in comparison to you. And that's kind of what the parables are like at the end. The parables of, are these things that give us a glimpse at a piece of the nature of the character of God and God's kingdom. But all of them fall short in comparison to the one that we're actually trying to pursue, the one that we seek to follow. All of them come short. We can compare and we can contrast and we can make as many metaphors as we want. But at the end of the day, they will all just be a piece, a facet, an aspect of this God who is far too big for us to understand or comprehend and far too gracious for anything that we deserve. And so at the end of the day, it's less about completely understanding the parables and more about completely understanding that this God of the parable is calling us to love him back. Because God's been loving you before you even knew you were you. And will continue to love you no matter what you do. I promise. But he does desire that we love him back. And so in hearing each of these parables, I hope that at some point, along the road that we were able to hear our discipleship path embedded in here. And that at the end of the day, what Jesus is calling us to, what God is calling us to, is a life of trust, of following, of going where it is that he leads, even maybe especially when we don't understand what that means. And so next week, when we do the upgrade, we're also going to be 
kind of pushing into a little bit more about what that means for us here at Huntsville First. Discipleship. Worship. Growing together in small groups. Finding places to serve. And living into a daily routine of faithfulness. It's simple. And yet it is so difficult for us to follow. And yet this is exactly what God is calling us to. A life of trust. A life of obedience. A life of love following this God of the parable. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we praise you and thank you for who you are. I thank you for uh, these dear ones who have gathered here today in your presence to lift up their praise to you, God. You are so worthy of it. And now we pray that as we continue to move from this space into our world, we pray that we would be like leaven, like yeast in the world around us, providing a little bit of rise. Or that we might be like a seed that gets fertilized and grows, becomes something that even birds can perch on. That we might embrace the treasure that is so valuable that we would sell everything that we've got to obtain it. And that we would become those who fish for people. Casting out that net and trusting you to be the one who brings the harvest. Continue to lead us, we pray, as we make our response to you, O oh God. Through Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we join in our closing hymn, number 643, When Love is Found. As we go this week, I give you a challenge to seek the kingdom of God. 
to figure out what that means for you and your family and in your life. So go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.